right. Uh, welcome to IO257, uh, accelerating your compute intensive workload at, uh, work, uh, application on Kubernetes engine. My name is Yoshi. I'm a product manager at Google, uh, looking into Kubernetes, uh, mostly working on GPU, TPU, and also uh, multi-tenancy. Hey, everyone. I'm Vish. I've been working at Google on various things, uh, Borg, and then recently Kubernetes. Uh, for the last year or year and a half, I've been focusing primarily on like, getting machine learning up and going with Kubernetes, and also like, trying to hopefully extend that to like, other more compute-intensive workloads. Cool. So let's then get started. Uh, we'll cover uh, two hot topics in the computer industry today. Uh, one is machine learning, and the other is containers. Both technologies are kind of two important pillar, critical pillars for modern computing. Oops, modern computing. You may ask, like, why containers for ML? Are they really a you know good combination? And you know, is it really relevant? Because we know that the audience, if the people who use container today are more on the engineering side, and who do the ML is more data scientists. I mean, those profiles are different. And we think, from our own experience, the answer is yes. ML workloads um, can also benefit from containers, just like any other workloads. And we're going to dig into more about the benefits throughout this session. For those who know containers, um, Kubernetes is something that what comes together, right? Uh, but for those who just heard containers, it's like not so intuitive. But no worries, we're going to show the value of Kubernetes and how it works well with uh, containers uh, you know, very soon. Just keep somewhere in the mind that in your mind that Kubernetes will allow your you know, allow you to make your machine learning applications cloud native. So who in the world actually does that? You know, who actually use you know, containers, Kubernetes, and machine learning like all together? And that's actually, it's us at Google. Like, like the keynote, I think uh, you know, all the uh, leaders uh, emphasize on Kubernetes machine learning. And it's definitely true that we actually use containers, Kubernetes, and machine learning on all together. And we, we, in case of internal Google, it's called Bohr, and we are basically you know, bringing that experience of uh, deploying machine learning application in container through such orchestration system to open source to everyone uh, through the open source Kubernetes. And that's a very exciting thing. So let me highlight the values that we learned throughout this experience uh, very quickly. First, um, containers should help improving uh, your productivity by packaging up your, you can package up your favorite tools and frameworks into container images. Then you can share them across the teams to standardize the tools and the frameworks and all the perhaps workloads. This will basically allow you to reuse everything that you know, somebody has created and then prevent reinventing the wheels, which is great for productivity. Secondly, uh, container will also help reducing, uh, reprodu reproducing reliable results. This is very important for data scientists. Anyone using the same image with the same configuration, pre-configured, and with the same tools and frameworks and the same data, Technically, everyone should be able to you know, reproduce very reliable results instead of you know, someone did in a different way, and as a result, it, you have to figure out time, why that happened. It's very time consuming, but you know, through standardizing, using the same thing, it, you, it will give you some sort of a, really, you know, getting the, you know, reproducing the reliable results. Third one is portability. You can easily pour your environment from one to another with containers. Um, we can also take containers very quickly to the cloud to take advantage of the unlimited, you know, huge resources whenever you need. So now we briefly understand the value, you know, how containers are great for machine learning. Um, is that it? Are you good enough? Let's step back for a moment um, about, you know, the overall picture. The reason that we're 
investing in machine learning could be improving, um, you know, greater or providing greater user experience uh, through machine learning, or perhaps increasing productivity through the automation that machine learning provides. So the goal here is to, in this like, diagram, is to really get into production from research and training as quickly as possible to maximize such investments. For that, we need to train um, their models at a large scale and then deploy the trained models continuously and quickly as possible in production for inference. This implies that you know, for your containers which has your machine learning applications, we need an infrastructure uh, to actually get to this point. And that's exactly where Kubernetes come into play. So let's look quickly take, uh, take a look into the values of Kubernetes. First um, is scales. Kubernetes provides very scalable infrastructure to process massive, massive number of workloads. It also, you can also run Kubernetes on a single workstation, and you can also run it on thousands of nodes in cloud as well. So it reads a really, it scales very well, and it provides you a scalable infrastructure. Kubernetes would also help you incre increase your productivity. What I mean by that is it will free you up from managing your own workstation, servers, even VMs. It lets you just simply focus on your application and services. You know, all the things that you have underneath it is something that you want to let Kubernetes to handle. And lastly, your Kubernetes applications are portable. You could pull your workloads to literally any Kubernetes deployment, whether it's in on-premise or on-prem or in cloud. Kubernetes provides an open and standard API. And it's portable across various products and services, really across vendors, and that vendor neutrality or it's developed, defined open source. This portability is very, very important for us. I mean, not only for us, but for the community. So let me quickly wrap up you know, the, the, the values that we just described. Why containers and Kubernetes for machine learning? With this, sorry, with this, um, with this diagram. So basically, let's call this like a cloud-native machine learning stack. In a nutshell, you just choose your favorite you know, machine learning framework and tools and pack it up into containers and then run them on Kubernetes at scale. It helps you to be productive. It will help you to reproduce reliable results. It will also help you deploy your application wherever you like, either it's an on-prem or cl in cloud. It also, uh, it also scales from a single workstation in front of you to thousands of thousands of nodes in cloud. Right, I think I kind of talked about the concept enough, and I feel now a little bit uncomfortable because uh, my background is more on the engineering side, so I want to see something working. And it's probably get you know, our hands dirty to see how that really works. Um, what I've just talked is not like concept. Well, I've talked about the concept, but what we're going to talk about here is like new features and products with demonstration. So it's not like vaporware or concept only thing. And I'm really, you know, very excited because these are really all available to you as of today. And you could literally do everything, really everything we're going to show, Fish is going to show uh, here uh, from today. First, we're excited to announce that MiniQ project uh, now supports GPUs. MiniQ, I guess it stands for Mini Kubernetes. Um, it's a great tool. It's a really, really great tool for anyone who's new to Kubernetes. You can run Minikube on your local work workstation and it, as it's a single node cluster inside a virtual machine. Uh, Google contributed, to, uh, contributed GPU support in Minikube because it makes the de uh, development, uh, develop and deploy and test workflow super fast. 
So we're very, very excited that another mini cube project supports uh, GPU. So how can we use it? Um, you first need a workstation, and you also need some spare GPU. So if your GPU is used by someone else, you need to kind of spare uh, some, you know, the rest of the GPU so that we can use it for the Minikube, uh, uh, and then we attach it to the virtual machine. Uh, we use the virtual machine here. So to use uh, KVM, uh, we need to have that in, installed. Oops, there's a timer. Thing. Is that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and also we use uh, IOMMU to uh, pass through the GPUs to the KVM on Minikube. Oops. I think there's an automated like, uh, thing going on, so I wanted to talk to the back side. Right. And uh, yeah, but that's pretty much it. And once you have that prerequisite done, um, you can start Minikube by putting this dash dash GPU into the Minikube command line. We're using KVM, so we put that VM driver there, but that's pretty much it. And after that, uh, we'll, you, know, you will install uh, NVIDIA driver uh, with these two commands. And w if you go through this step, your, your workstation is running Kubernetes, connected to GPU, and you're ready to go. So let's really start running a job. How are you gonna do that? It's really, really, really simple. Um, oops, sorry. There you go. It's really, really simple. Um, in this example, um, we, all you have to do is to specify the type of the you know, GPU, type of the resource you want to use and the amount of the GPU that you need. So in this particular example, we're requesting two NVIDIA GPUs uh, from that workstation. And that's pretty much it. This is all you have to do to access to the GPU, uh, for, to the Minikube, uh, which Minikube has uh, in your workstation. All right, so next, let's, I just went through the quick example, but let's run our first container with GPUs on Minikube. So one or two, big bitch come on stage. Just give me a second as I get logged into my laptop. Yeah, and let's switch the screen. Okay. So to start off, I just want to highlight that there is a very detailed, useful set up a usage guide for Minikube that you can go and look up on GitHub. So you don't have to like memorize or remember everything we show here and you have like a really good guide that you can follow once you go back to your workstations. So um, hope this is readable by everyone. Okay, cool. so what I want to show here is like, I want to show that I have a workstation and I have GPUs attached to this workstation. So if I run, um, okay, uh, I, Yes, I need to connect again. Just give me a second. This is what happens if I log out and log back in. And as I go through my security, okay, there we go. And I need to reset the size. Let me just do this again. So what I want to show here is like, I have two GPUs on my workstation. I have one running uh, that's driving uh, my display. And so that Minikube is not going to use that by default. And then I'm going to have, I have a secondary SPAD GPU, which Minikube will pick up automatically. So setting up Minikube is pretty easy. As Yoshi said, all you have to do is like literally just type in this command that I have pre-typed here. So I can just say Minikube start, but I'm not going to do that now here, because it's going to take like 30 seconds for it to set up. And I've already pre-set it up for you. Um, so let's go look at the status. Um, and Minikube says there's already a VM running here, right? So there's, there's Minikube running. For those of you who, don't, who aren't familiar with Minikube, it's Kubernetes that's really easy to run locally on your laptop or on your workstation, whether it's on a Mac or, or on, on Windows or Linux, right? But in this case, uh, GPUs work primarily on Linux for now, so you'll have to like, stick to a Linux force for, for running with GPUs. Can you um, then describe the, your, your Minikube environment very quickly then? Yeah, definitely. So let me show uh, what the Kubernetes capacity looks like for, for those of you who are familiar with Kubernetes node capacity. What we expect to see here is we expect to see as part of capacity, GPU showing up. So there's already CPUs I've allocated four for my VM. Um, and I also allocated some memory about like 16 gigs. Um, and I also allocated a single GPU, right? I didn't have to manually allocate, but then the whole Minikube workflow automatically picks that up. So we have a Minikube with a GPU attached, 
So next off, our step, our next part of our demo is to like actually show an ML training job and show it to be running on Minikube locally. And then let's see if we can pull up TensorBoard that shows the job's progress. Um, for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a pre-can model, because the point of this demo is not to build cool ML models, but rather show how infrastructure just works seamlessly. Um, so I'm going to use a pre-trained or like pre-built model, uh, which is ResNet. For those of you who are familiar with that, I'm using ResNet 50 specifically in this case. Uh, Google TensorFlow team has already optimized that quite a bit, so I'm going to reuse the same model. And I have it uh, packaged as part of a container image, and I have my data set for this model stored on my workstation. So I'm going to use NFS to map the data set into my Minikube VM, and similarly, I can map in my code also from my host. Right? So uh, those are possibilities that you have working uh, iteratively on your workstation. So let me go ahead and get to that. Um, so I have, I'm going to go ahead and launch. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the job here. So for those of you who are curious, let me show you what job I actually launched. I'm pulling it up on GitHub because it's a little bit more easier to read. So I have a container here that has TensorFlow and the repository, and the ResNet repository that I just showed, already prepackaged as part of a container. And I'm running, I'm running literally the same instructions that's mentioned on the official ResNet model. Right? It's the same set of instructions, except that it's run from a container, and it's declaratively specified as a Kubernetes configuration. In this configuration, you can take and port it and run it on any minikube, and you will get the same results. And that's what Yoshi was referring to when he said like portability and reproducibility. Um, so, and I also like tweak some of the parameters to make sure that it runs reasonably locally. I don't want to like wait for 10 days for some one epoch to run, so I want it to be really fast. Um, so now that's done, let's go look at the job if it's actually running. So the job is already running. Let's look at its logs and see if it's showing uh, GPUs. So what we're expecting to see is we're expecting TensorFlow to show that it's using GPUs. So we can see that here. It's saying that it's, sorry, it's showing that it's using a GPU device, Quadro M4000. That happens to be the free GPU on my workstation. And TensorFlow is like automatically picking that up. And you don't have to change much, right? You don't really have to change TensorFlow. You could take a pre-can model and run it on Kubernetes. And training is already starting. And if you were to like pull up TensorBoard for this, it would look something like this. Um, so training is happening now. And uh, if you look at the TensorBoard instance, this is from a pre-trial pre run that I did before the demo. But you've seen that if I wait for a day, it'll make some progress of about like two epochs. And the, the progress rate is about two images per second. So this is not really for real training, but this is more for fine-tuning and getting your model working so you can actually like, do it at scale on like, really large machines. So that's, that's sort of all I had to say about Minikube Yoshi. Okay, thanks, Fish. I'm switch back to yep. slides. That's good. All righty. Thanks, Fish. So now we have our first ML application running on Minikube, and it's great, and it's using GPU. Now, luckily, we are already saturating the GPU there, and we thought that our application our models are I mean, heavier than we thought. So what should we do? Should we buy more workstations? Or should we build a data center, or at least plan building a data center? Probably not. Let's go to uh, Google Kubernetes Engine, because it's the best place to run machine learning in containers. Um, that's because GPUs in Kubernetes Engine is now generally available and ready for the enterprise. GPUs in Kubernetes Engine allows you to uh, allows your container to access GPU via Kubernetes API. There's no need to manage your own hardware like workstations, servers, or even VMs. Just consume the GPUs uh, whenever you need and as much as you like. This flexibility is something that cloud can provide. And we're also uh, we're excited that our customers are loving this product, as the GPU core hours, since we, uh, uh, we introduced back, since, uh, back in uh, 2017, uh, the core hours has exploded to more than 10x. And this is very, very exciting for us. And 
whenever we have this conversation about and getting feedback about this feature, people are just loving. People are just loving the, the elastic, access, flexible aspect of accessing GPUs uh, through Kubernetes engine for their containers. We have a wide range of GPUs in Kubernetes. All, all, in, all GPU uh, models available in Computer Engine can be also used in uh, uh, Kubernetes Engine. For example, uh, NVIDIA V100, um, this is a high-end GPU with top performance for both training and inference. So if you're wondering training and inference, this V100 is a perfect choice because it's good at both. P100 is a well-balanced GPU, a good poor performance, and the cost is a lot lower. That balance is somebody, uh, something that people like about. K80, well, the last, but really not the least, because this is indeed the most widely used GPU as, as far as we're aware of. And it's a great for starters. So if you're done with the workstation, if you're wondering which GPU to use, K80 is definitely a good kind of starting point. So speaking of reducing cost, um, I didn't mention in the slide, but we also have an interesting feature called preemptible uh, VMs or preemptible GPUs, which where you can access to this GPU with a lot lower cost. The difference is that your uh, GPU could be evicted with a short notice, which means that if you could tune your application to handle like checkpoint frequently or you know, have somehow handle the robustness part, you can actually achieve very high performance with very low cost. And some people are really using this wisely for their batch workloads. You know, if you're running a batch workload, you, know, you don't actually use the GPU all the time. So you just quickly ramp up and quickly ramp down. And preemptible GPUs are a really perfect solution for that. Now, in addition to these uh, GPUs that I introduced, we're very excited to announce that NVIDIA P4 is also now available as beta in Kubernetes engine. P4 is a very unique uh, GPU, which comes with a very fast inference performance. We didn't talk about inference, so we're going to you know, show that later. But it, with a very, very fast uh, inference performance, but you, know, the tr you can actually save the cost significantly. So this, uh, uh, this GPU is a very unique one you know, if you compare it to the rest of the, um, the GPU models that we have in our family. So it was a great addition. So then let's look into how you could actually use uh, GPUs in Kubernetes Engine. In this example, I'm creating a node pool uh, with GPUs uh, and attaching to a cluster. Node pool is a very simple concept that there's a, you know, virtual machines inside a pool, and then we specify uh, a GPU there. And you can attach it to any Kubernetes Engine cluster uh, whenever you like. We chose this example because it, has, it will give you more flexibility. If you wanted to attach you know, to your existing cluster, it's more you know, flexible. And if you don't need it, you can actually scale down your node pool to uh, zero later, which I will describe later. In this case, uh, we're creating two nodes with one NVIDIA, the top high-end uh, performance V100 on each node, and then attaching to this pool into an existing cluster. And that's pretty much it for the setup. So now let's consume those GPUs. Again, that you might realize that this example is actually the same as the previous one that we used for a minikube. And you're right. Um, the same spec, this one is requesting two NVIDIA GPUs, right? But this time, instead of requesting that on a workstation, it's requesting two NVIDIA GPUs in the cluster, in the cloud. So, this will tell, I hope this will tell you that you know, Kubernetes you know, API and also applications are really, really portable. GPUs and Kubernetes engines are already, uh, already flexible and scalable, but that's not it. We also have cluster autoscaler with GPU, and this is really only available on Google Kubernetes engine. It would automatically scale up the cluster whenever needed, and down, and to hit the performance, you know, to hit the best performance over cost. Um, the, nodes of the, no, the nodes with the GPUs will be automatically created when a cluster may need more capacity. And 
I think the scaling up is pretty intuitive, but for because GPUs are much more expensive compared to CPUs, the scaling down aspect kind of resumes, at least to me, very well. So the nodes with GPUs also get uh, deleted when they're idle. So you don't necessarily have to spin up a uh, empty you know, uh, node with empty, uh, you know, empty cycles. It will always be adjusting to your workload. So then how can we um, access, you know, you know, use this you know, cool feature? It's very simple and easy. All you have to do is to turn on the auto scaler, you know, uh, with a small sample uh, with uh, several flags. And I'm using the previous example here. So what I did here is put this enable dash dash, dash enable uh, auto scaling, and put min specify minimum, you know, going down to scale down to minimum to zero node, and scale up to maximum five nodes. So if I need more capacity, it will go up to five nodes. If I'm idle, it will go down to zero. And this is exactly why we wanted to introduce this uh, node pool, because if you just specify this particular group to use GPU, and if you don't have any workload that has a GPU, that requires GPUs, it can go down to zero. And once you have it, it will scale up back to five again. Sorry. Yeah, and this, the other part is exactly the same. We have two nodes in the node pool, and uh, node, this node has, uh, each node has one uh, V100. Okay, so let's uh, look into the demonstration again. So this time, we're gonna go through the demonstration of uh, GPUs and Kubernetes engine, and this time we're gonna do the training uh, for, to show the power of that. Right, back to you, Vishen. Yeah, thank you, Yoshi. So, I wanna show that it's actually really straightforward to do whatever Yoshi said through the UI, right? Like, and you can do this through the command line too. So I won't take too much time, but I just wanna highlight the fact that you can create a cluster pretty quickly and you can either attach GPUs to your cluster directly, like your default node pool, um, or you can like create a cluster without GPUs and then add more node pools, which I'll show in just a bit. So I have a, I have a pre-created cluster here and I can go and edit this pre-created cluster and I can add node pools. And it's not just this. Uh, there'll be another talk later today. Or is it today? Uh, I think I have the th that one in the Okay, awesome. Right. So Yoshi will talk about that in just a bit. But where GK would automatically create node pools for you. So you don't even have to like go manually create GPU node pools. So for the purpose of this demo, I have created, pre-created a GK cluster, and I have various kinds of node pools. The default one is the one that you get when you create the cluster. And then I have a GPU pool where each node has one GPU attached. So I have 10 nodes and I have 10 GPUs. And, and auto scaling is turned on where it can scale from 10 to 100, right? And I have another node pool where each node has eight Tesla V1 that's attached to it, and it can scale from 10 to 100 again, right? So I have this dynamic pool, and it can scale back to zero if I want to, but for the demo, I've set it up at 10. Um, so now that the cluster is there, let's do something interesting with it. I'm gonna do something, and then I'll come back and explain what I just did. So um, just bear with me for a moment, and then I'll explain what I exactly did. So I'm launching a few jobs here. Okay, just know that I'm launching lots of jobs, and each of them are taking some amount of GPUs, and I explain what is going on. So for the purposes of the demo, like a typical life cycle for an ML model is like you create some very basic structure for your model, and then you want to explore your hyperparameters, right? Like you want to see what set of hyperparameters are going to uh, best suit my current data or the model structure that I've come up with, right? So to illustrate that, I've chosen three hyperparameters here for ResNet, the same model. I've not changed the model from like the Minikube uh, environment to the GK environment. I've chosen uh, my illustrative hyperparameters to be the base starting learning rate, the batch sizes for the GPU, and the, the, the neural net depth choices. So I have all the way from like 34 to 152. So what happened behind the scenes is I used a very simple bash script. You could do something much more interesting. Uh, and the bash script essentially went through this whole grid search across all these different hyperparameters. And it created a Kubernetes job where it's, it's almost running the same command that I ran locally, right? Except that I'm updating more hyperparameters than what I did locally. So it's, it's the same code that I'm running in the cloud. Can you show the parameter part a little bit more so that people Yeah, definitely. So 
the parameters are learning rate, the initial learning rate, and the batch sizes. That is like how many uh, data sets do you do you, uh, train on in every given moment on a GPU, and then you have depth choices, which is the size of the neural net itself. And I guess that you already started your ML training job with the first command that you ran, right? Yeah, and the other thing that I want to highlight is each job here is, each part here is using eight GPUs, right? So you're getting a, a DGX1 like box in the cloud on demand, um, and you get it when you need it, and you can get rid of it when you don't need it. So it's like really high performance compute available to you on demand. And let me highlight what happened as part of submitting the job, right? So I have the GKE workloads view here. What we see is we see a whole bunch of jobs. Like I, sh like I showed earlier, I only have 10 nodes in my node pool that has eight GPUs. So 10 jobs are already running, right? Because the nodes are already there. The rest of them are in the unschedulable state. And if you go look at the cluster itself, right, and if we uh, if I just refresh this page, and if I look at the cluster, what we expect to see is we ex expect to see more nodes being added automatically to that node pool. Um, and once this loads, what you'll see here is like there's no 32 nodes, right? Because I added, I, add, I started 32 pods, and there were 10 nodes originally, and then now there's like 22 more nodes automatically added to my node pool. And then in just a bit, we would see that these pods are also going to get scheduled. But what I've done is, for this demo, is not wait for these jobs to actually start, start running and then show that they're using GPUs and so on, because that's going to take quite a while. Because you're, you're, and training is also going to take like many, many days for it to complete, even with eight GPUs. Um, so what I've done is I have pre-trained for a few epochs. And I'm, I have TensorBoard loaded up here. Right? I, I have some pre-trained data, and I'm loading TensorBoard here. So what I want to highlight is that with the TensorFlow and with the Kubernetes ecosystem, you can do like really large-scale batch hyperparameter sweeps. And you can like observe all your different hyperparameters here through TensorBoard. And you get this really nice uh, like sort of interconnected ecosystem that makes, that, makes your, uh, that makes your data scientists really, really productive. And that's the that's the key point that we want to drive through this. Do you want to go back to the the, the UI to show that to make sure that you know your pod is also consuming? Uh, oh yeah, definitely. So if we drill into one of the jobs here, what we see is a job is a construct. It's a batch construct that right? makes sure that one one pod or x number of pods complete based on how you configure it. So if we go in here, um, what you see here is like you start seeing GPU metrics, right? You start seeing GPU memory and GPU duty cycle. These metrics show up only if your pod is actually consuming GPUs. And you see some actual data here. I don't know if it's actually visible, but it's the, po the pod is just starting up, and it's like starting to actively use the GPUs. Um, and so you can see those metrics there. And if you go into the logs, it'll probably show the same thing that I showed locally, except that it'll show that there are... Could actually you take, yeah, I think uh, people might want to see it a little bit. Oh, yeah, Let's sure. try doing Let's that. Let's try that. Um, Let's wait for the logs to load. OK. Let's see if, OK. I'm having some. The loading is not working. Yeah. Um, so you have to like, go to the beginning of the training run <laughs> to, uh, to look at the initial log line. OK. And you could just keep going while you'll find it. Yeah. All right. I, I can, I'll probably pull it up when we yep. do the next demo. That's good. Uh -huh. I'm switching back to the deck. Yep. Yep. OK. So that's a kind of a quick demonstration of this running training on top of Google uh, Kubernetes engine using GPUs. And literally, he was typing the command in front of me. So uh, the training job kicked off very quickly. And all of a sudden, the autoscaler kicked in, the, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, added the nodes that were missing. And then the job started running, as you, you know, kind of just see. So that part is the elastic part is really amazing. Now, training is just something in the middle. It's just only one piece. And the next step is that, of course, uh, putting that in production and you know, doing running inference. So in the next, in the next demonstration, we want to show the exact same infrastructure uh, in Kubernetes Engine can be used uh, for uh, inference and prediction in production. So, Bish, wanna? Yeah, just a second. Sure. Um, do you want to switch? Yeah, to I my can screen? switch that. Sure. Thank you. Let's go. Okay. 
So again, I'm going to do something, and then I'm going to explain what I just did. Um, OK, that's done. So let's go back here. What I have here um, in my UI is I have a serving deployment. For anyone who's familiar with Kubernetes, a deployment is like the very basic construct for running web services or, or any sort of like web app. So the deployment gives you like abilities to do blue bean uh, rollouts and like you can do like A-B testing and so on. So it has lots of primitives to do like gradual rollouts and so on. And there's like a huge ecosystem around it. So what I want to illustrate here is that you can use the same construct and do uh, ML inference in production. So what I have running here is a Kubernetes deployment that is uh, serving um, TensorFlow, uh, that's using TensorFlow serving, and it's serving an inception, con an inception model. I'll show you that model here. So I have, I don't know if it's legible enough, but yeah, so I have the pre-canned inception model that I'm, and, I'm, and I'm serving that, right? Like it, there's, there's nothing really fancy going on here. The facts that I want to highlight are the fact that you can use pre-built TensorFlow images. You don't, all you have to do is bring your model. You don't have to change anything else. You can take, like, you can take for example, my example uh, deployment that I have here, which is checked in on GitHub, and you can change the model, and you can get going, right? And I also want to highlight one more fact, not just this. As what I also did in the background, which I said I'll explain in a bit, is like I started some load. Like it's not interesting if I'm just running in friends, right? Like I have to, I have to do something with it, and I want to like simulate real world scenario. And what I've did is like I've started clients in the background, and what the clients are doing is they are sending prediction requests to this uh, TensorFlow deployment uh, that I have running here. So what would, what would you expect when your system gets loaded with your load generator? Yeah, I mean, what I would expect is my, uh, my, my load generator to, to go ahead and, um, like, what I would ideally expect my system to do is, like, I, I would expect the system to automatically scale up and then meet my load, right? Got it. Um, and so I want to see if that happens here. Got it. Oh, okay, that's actually happening here. So what's happening is we saw a single pod here, and Kubernetes is automatically adding more and more pods based on the demand. So what we see here is the demand was not ex non-existent, and then I started the load. Then we see that the, the duty cycle of the GPUs are actually going up. And I'm using Kubernetes native auto-scaling primitives. I've already set up like auto-scaling for this uh, TensorFlow deployment here, and you can reuse that too if you want to. Um, and, and I've set it up such that whenever my duty cycle crosses the threshold, add more pods. Right? And that's exactly what we see happening here as more pods are getting added. Got it. So do I need to build a container to kind of assert my model? Maybe you already touched this, but do I need to build a container to? No, you don't really have to. So in fact, I can show that here. So I'm going to go ahead and change this. I'm going to change the model that I'm serving. That's all I did, right? Like I went ahead. I did this live through edit. You could do this through like GitOps, or you could have your own way of managing configs. But once you do that, what's going to happen is Kubernetes would do a rolling deployment. So we see that version 3 is being created here. And there are also health checks embedded into the TensorFlow serving container. So the, new, the, the old pods don't get removed until the new pods are serving, ready to serve logically. And that's a key point, because you can do simple rolling updates, but doing rolling updates that are safe, that doesn't drop traffic, is not that easy. Yeah, maybe we want to stick to this screen. And in fact, I think uh, when people ask us about, yeah, you're doing GPU, you're doing uh, a lot of things here, what is actually the, the value that we're providing? This screen, indeed, because regardless, even if it's actually ML application or not, it's another application. And if you're bringing those into production, you definitely do want to have your existing version running and then keep updating behind the scene. And that's where Kubernetes is really good at. And with this GPU integration, it's all coming together. So I think this kind of shows you that how Kubernetes and Kubernetes engine helps you to bring your ML application from training to production in a very light way. We didn't even cover the hot CI-CD tool chain. He just edited all in online. I'm sure that you know, that's not the best way, apparently. So we should definitely include some sort of uh, you know, version control and system into the workflow. But I want to say that you know, that's the kind of primitive that we do have on Kubernetes engines with GPUs. So I introduced that uh, GPUs and Kubernetes are ready for enterprise. And if I just say so, it's not like, yeah, you're saying that. But we would like to share some you know, all the voices from our users. 
Um, Ocado, the world's largest online-only grocery re retailer, has been using our GPUs in Kubernetes engine. They said GPUs in Kubernetes engines are powerful, cost-effective, and flexible for their enterprise-grade machine learning. We're very excited about uh, their customers lo you know, uh, uh, loving our product. So GPUs and Kubernetes engines are perfect for your ML application. And we hopefully highlighted the, the key parts of that. However, machine learning, as we also saw from today's keynote, it is evolving every day, really. And the challenge there is this increasing complexity, uh, increasing complexity and as a result, the compute needs. What if you need more power in the future? We, Google, hit that problem like five years ago. If people use voice search with speed recognition for just three minutes a day, it's like five years ago, like a long time. So I'm pretty sure with all the cool gadgets like Google Home and Assistant, I think this number is too pessimistic nowadays. But they said we would need to double our data center, double our data center, meaning Google data center, a ton of data centers, but we said, they said we got to double. To me, the computation demands is really, really like big moment. And this is exactly why we build Tensor, tensor Processing Unit, or shortened TPU. Today, we're very excited to announce that this cloud TPU is in, in Kubernetes is now publicly av available in beta. You can now use hardware accelerator that Google designed just for machine learning at, in Kubernetes Engine. Like, many, like, we've been, like, like we have been consistent, you can access to this cloud TPU via Kubernetes API, like many other resources. You don't need to manage uh, the cloud TPU by yourself. Kubernetes Engine will take care of the life cycle for you. It will also automatically scale the number of cloud TPUs whenever you need, and as much as you like, as far as you have the quota. The performance of cloud TPU is just unbelievable. Um, on a single cloud TPU device with eight TPU cores, you can train the, the ResNet 50 that Vish has been showing with more than 3,000 images per second. And it finishes in about nine hours. Not only that, with this half-size TPU pod, you can train with more than 77,000 images per second. Honestly, I'm not a person who runs machine learning all the time or models also all the time. So this number is kind of too large, really, that too hard to kind of feel what this really kind of means. So just telling you that, OK, I mentioned nine hours with that one cloud TPU device. This gigantic thing will you know, get the job done in 30 minutes. And that, I think that's much more kind of a tangible. So with the, the time that you, know, you reduce, you, know, you can take a break, you can go home early. Or more seriously, I think you can spend more time on interesting stuff. You, know, you can make this cycle faster and faster. So this performance is just mind blowing. And I think I, you kind of imagine Access into this cloud TPU in Kubernetes engine is very straightforward. When creating a cluster, all you have to do is to specify in it dash s enable TPU. We recently introduced uh, this feature from 110, so we just wanted to you know, specify or you know, convey that clearly. But eventually, when the G uh, Google Kubernetes engine always comes with larger than you know, 110, you don't need this flag anymore. And we're using alias, IP, IP alias uh, as a, as, uh, in the behind the scenes. So we're putting dash dash enable IP alias uh, to enable it. But that's pretty much it to, for the setup. So now let's consume uh, the cloud GPUs uh, to, uh, uh, for our containers. This time, we cannot use the same example that I've been using here and there. Because instead of uh, GPUs, we're requesting cloud GPUs. So we have to change that. But in this case, uh, we're, you, we're requesting eight cloud TPU v2 cores, which is actually one cloud TPU device uh, from our quota. And that's the change you have to make for your prospect. All right, then let's see how it's working. And Vish, come on again.
So how can yeah. I use a cloud TPU from Kubernetes it's, engine? It's actually very straightforward. So I have a, again, I'm going to bore everyone with the same model and the same pod spec. There's nothing really fancy going on this time either. <laughs> so I have the same model code that I showed earlier. Um, and we are running a slightly simpler set of parameters here. Uh, because the model is like already set up by default to run on TPUs, because I used a, a model that was already optimized for TPUs. And that's the thing that I really like the most with TPUs, is that you get this off-the-shelf models that are already optimized, where if your, your business case is just to apply ML to your existing data, where you want to like make some tweaks to your existing models, it's really straightforward. You don't have to like fiddle with anything else, and you can just get going. And if you want to like run it at scale, or if you want to like run it periodically, if, if you want any sort of automation on that, GKE makes that really, really simple. So uh, as Yoshi said, I've requested a single TPU uh, donut here. And I've also like specified a, a TensorFlow version 1.9. And this is something you can do, where you can choose specific versions of TensorFlow uh, so that it works. Um, what I've done in the background, just to save time, is like I already went ahead and started this job that I just showed. I want to like pull up the, the GKE workloads UI again. So what we see here is like the ResNet job. Um, it's aptly named ResNet TPU. And um, there's a pod that belongs to this job. And if we go and look at the job's requirements, let me pull this up, we'll see that it's asking for uh, a single TPU donor. Um, and training has already started. So we can probably look at its logs. Um, and see that it's, it's so see here, that training is already going on. It's processing some, some number of samples per second. I also want to pull up TensorBoard. So I can pull up TensorBoard for this exact training instance. But instead, what I've done is I've pulled up TensorBoard for uh, an instance that has already been pre-trained. And what we see here is like, you see that with the default hyperparameters that have been set up for ResNet, you're able to process about, like Yoshi said, you're able to process about 3,350 or 400 images per second. Um, and the other cool part that I really like about TPUs is that if you want to scale beyond a single donut, and if you want to like get to larger slices, you just increase the batch size. I, I'm not sure for what all models it works, but for the ones that it works, it's like a really easy to use uh, user uh, interface. Um, that's that's all I had about cool. TPUs, Yoshi. Thank you very much. It's really really impressive and powerful. Alrighty. So I think it's time to wrap up our kind of long journey. Uh, we introduced a number of projects and products. Um, but all of these are something that you could start using today. There's no whitelist. You can, you know, there's no need to contact me to, can I use it? Everything is all available to you. And we hope this you know, talk will be also online very soon so that you know, we cover a lot. So we can read, you know, go through you know, vicious demonstration, and you know, really, really get your hands dirty you know, by yourself. So just to kind of recap, um, we introduced uh, GPU support uh, in Minikube, which is great for starters. Uh, we talk about GPUs in Kubernetes, which is generally available with a wide range of GPUs available and with the autoscaler. And lastly, we, we announced uh, the cloud TPU in Kubernetes engines. But besides on all those products and features, what I really wanted to you know, convey today is that Containers are really great for uh, machine learning. And I could constantly say that from my experience inside of Google and talking to Vish and all the great uh, Googlers uh, inside. And Kubernetes is indeed great for such uh, containers as well. So looking at you know, going back to this um, stack again, but choose your favorite ML uh, machine learning framework and tools, pack it up into containers, run on Kubernetes at scale. That's uh, what I really wanted to talk about today. So thank you for listening. <laughs>